Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alana and I review books on this channel. So if you like long format book reviews, I'm your girl, go ahead on and subscribe to it. By the time this video goes up, it will be the new year. Happy new year. We made it to 2023. The last two years were a bit of a blur, were they not? They all kind of ran together into nonsense and chaos. But here we are in 2023 where our expectations are lower and lower. So anyway, I think it's appropriate to wrap, not wrap up, but uh, start off the year with a book review of my favorite book of all time, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. I have read this book four times as of this video, but I never annotated it. And the last time I read the book was in 2018 and I didn't post book content anywhere on the internet. So it is time to review this monster. This is what's also crazy. My next video that goes live, that will be on January 8th. That means I would have started my YouTube channel one year ago. Crazy. So let's, let's not reminisce any longer. We're going to hop right into this review because this is going to be a long review because Jane Eyre deserves it. And I still didn't cover everything that there is to cover in this book because that is impossible. Unless you want to sit for two hours and ain't, ain't nobody got vocal cords for that. <laughs> okay. I still possessed my soul and with it, the certainty of ultimate safety. Jane Eyre. Jane, Jane, Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. People like to make it a romance, but I'm going to argue it is a coming of age story. Ultimately, it's also, and I watched a, a review of somebody that somebody sent me several weeks ago. Actually, it was a week of Thanksgiving. It's a coming of age story. It's also a spiritual awakening. For Jane more than anything else yes we have this dynamic relationship by Jane and her love interest Mr. Rochester but ultimately this is Jane coming into herself so Jane is an orphan she is raised by her aunt her parents passed away when she was but a wee bairn okay and so she her 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 mother's brother who is wealthy her mother came from a wealthy family, but she married for love. Her mother married for love and she married a poor clergyman. So her family was like, forget you girl, you didn't marry. We ain't got time for that. So whatever. So what, when her parents die, her uncle John, I believe her uncle John, right? Irrelevant. Her uncle takes her in much to the despair and loathing of her aunt Reed. So that's the, so her, her uncle Reed took her in. And so when her uncle Reed dies, she's then left to the unloving care of her aunt Reed. And aunt Reed is the worst. She's horrible. And so she is the odd woman out here. Okay. Poor little Jane. Her aunt hates her. Her cousins hate her and she's mistreated and abused. And so eventually her aunt sends her to Lowood school just to get Jane out of the house and get Jane out of her way. But Jane does receive a formal education at Low Lowood. Lowood is also a struggle. Jane. Jane goes through all the time. And so, but she does get some academic accomplishments. And with those academic accomplishments, Jane becomes a governess. And she becomes a governess to the ward of a Mr. Rochester at Thornfield Hall to a young French girl named Adele. Adele is the best. 2006 BBC adaptation miniseries of Jane Eyre. That Adele is my favorite Adele. She is a card. She's a character. So as one could guess, you know, you've got young single Jane, 18 year old Jane and Mr. Rochester and they catch feelings. However, there's always a however. Mr. Rochester is harboring a secret and Jane must choose Mr. Rochester or his own convictions. I don't know why I had to call him Mr. Rochester, but I mean, Mr. Rochester. And again, all this ties back to Jane coming of age as she's coming into herself. What does she believe spiritually? What does her, what, what does she feel convicted about based on her own faith, her religious faith? 
all has to do with her coming into herself as a young woman. I have said, again, countless times that Jane Eyre is my favorite novel. But I, again, I've never reviewed this book. And I will say that I, I read this book and finished it back in October. And it took me a long time <laughs> to get my thoughts together and to, to draft up this review. And it was, it's, there as you can see, the annotations in this book. And I didn't mark everything. So I will be reading Jane Eyre for the rest of my life. So I've got the rest of my life to continue to annotate <laughs> this book. It's very clear from the beginning of the novel that Jane is an outsider. She's strong-willed, smart, and witty, yet because she is poor and she has no means and she is not pretty, she's plain, she's not attractive in the classical sense, she is scorned by many, especially those of the upper class. However, Jane has this really strong sense of self and independence that does get refined as she gets older and she matures because Jane has a bit of a temper, which I like it. Like she, she, she's rambunctious. She's a firecracker. Jane, Jane is, Jane is who she is. She has opinions and she's strong willed, but she learns how to temper that, not suppress it, but grow with it and adapt it as she gets older. She also has this ability to see people clearly and she speaks her mind. And again, she, but she just learns how to mature it. You know, it's, it's, she learns tact, if you will. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. And you can forgive young Jane for, um, being a little bit more rambunctious because she's young. I mean, she was in her single digits. So, I mean, what's with the, you know, she was young. She was in her single digits. I don't know what's happening here. I'm getting, this is my fourth video in a row. And my voice is starting to go. <laughs> anyway, so Jane said, I resisted all the way, a new thing for me. If all the world hated you and believed you wicked while your own conscience approved you and absolved you from guilt, you would not be without friends. I can live alone if self-respect and circumstances require me to do so. I need not sell my soul to buy bliss. I have an inward treasure born with me, which can keep me alive if all extraneous details, sh sorry, delights should be withheld or offered only at a price I cannot afford to give. Those quotes are why show why Jane Eyre is my favorite female character in literature. She is such a breath of fresh air. And this book was published in 1847. Jane refused and she's just she's still very fresh to me. Jane refuses to give into pressure. She doesn't compromise her convictions for the sake of temptation to fit in or to be loved by everybody. To, and she doesn't do any of those things to sacrifice her own ethics, her own sense of morality for fleeting, for fleeting pleasure or to be temporarily and shallowly loved by the masses. Jane is very long-sighted. And by that, I mean, she sees how actions may impact the future and their consequences. She's always thinking ahead. She's like, if I do this, it's not about the satisfaction that I'm going to get now. How is this going to have an impact on me in the future? And like I watched this other review that somebody sent me, or I was, I would say it was more of a podcast, more of a conversation, these two individuals. She, Jane was like, not only what are the consequences, what are the spiritual implications that this is going to have on me? You know, do I just give in? Or how am I going to suffer for this later? She does not live in the here and now. She's not impulsive at all. And I find more and more reading a character like this in the 21st century is just a breath. It's just a breath of fresh air because people are, we live in a society where people are, I think maybe increasingly becoming more impulsive. They don't think about stuff and how it's going to affect them in the future they just do it and i'm like did you think about did you think before you did you think before you got into that situation <laughs> i used to work with children and um youth and i borrowed this phrase from somebody i know who was a teacher 
she would tell students and I would also tell young people when I was working with them, you know how you got yourself into this situation? Too much feeling and not enough thinking. Yeah, now you're crying, okay? So you gotta, you gotta talk to children straight, okay? <laughs> and they would look at me like, I guess you're right. I know, I know. Think before you act. <laughs> and so Jane thinks before she acts. And Jane is the antithesis of impulsivity. And she truly understands herself and who she is. And that is ultimately enough for her. However, that doesn't mean that Jane does not care about how other people feel about her. Jane always has, and you get this from the beginning of the book, Jane has this huge desire and longing to be loved, truly loved by somebody. And it's within human nature to desire those types of healthy relationships. And Jane is a, a character in particular that loves to be understood because she is a rare creature. There is no happiness like that of being loved by your fellow creatures and feeling that your presence is in addition to their comfort. So that's when we have Mr. Rochester. Okay, I'm dropping the R. It's not Mr. Rochester. We're going to call him Mr. Rochester because he's a, he's, he's a character. He's a trip with no luggage. Okay. Mr. Rochester is an enigma and he is not typically viewed by many readers, especially female readers I've noticed in a positive light because he's very morally gray and it's sometimes quite wrong. But I personally enjoy his character because he is such an enigma and I find him to be just as complex and fascinating as Jane. I also find him to be widely misunderstood. Also, he is Jane's love interest. And this is a story where I trust Jane as a main character. Jane is so smart and she's so clear sighted and she's such a good judge of the person's heart. She knows how to look past in some cases, people's actions and see the person beneath. And that's how she judges people. She looks past the exterior and the facade that they're putting on. And she knows how to actually look at the character of a person. Who are they at their soul? And so I trust Jane's judgment of Rochester because I trust Jane, you see, and Jane Sorry, in Rochester, Rochester is the only character that actually sees Jane who as for who she is, despite her plain looks, this, despite her lack of social currency and the fact that she's poor. He looks beyond all of those other things that society values and sees her true nature. Jane and Rochester, regardless, regardless of if you like Mr. Rochester or not, they are intellectual and emotional and spiritual, eventually a spiritual equals. And if the reader likes him or not, or always agrees with his action, that's actually irrelevant. Charlotte Bronte, I think, did this on purpose. She created, she proved her point by creating Mr. Rochester. Only Jane under understands Mr. Rochester. The reader may not ever be able to understand Rochester because it's not for us to understand Rochester. It's for Jane to understand Rochester. She made his her, Jane's love interest difficult to understand. Again, proving the point that he is a flavor that only Jane can truly appreciate, which is why I do not bash Rochester. Again, do I agree with him? Is he sometimes wrong? Yes, but... I also don't like how people ignore the fact that he repents at the end. He has a literal come to Jesus moment in a lot of ways. And he acknowledges the things that he's done that are not savory. He is not to them what he is to me. He is not of their kind. I believe he is mine. He is of mine and I am sure he is. I feel akin to him. I understand the language of his countenance and his movements. All right, so this is where I'm going to get into Jane and Rochester a little bit more. And I am going to, so in order to do that, I'm going to talk on one big theme of this book, which is freedom. All of this is actually going to build. I have to talk about this first before I build onto something to, in order to build onto something else. So. Freedom. Jane in particular, but not just Jane. There are several other key characters in this book where this is huge for freedom. 
Jane is a character, along with others, that feels confined and longs for experiences and a life outside of her monotonous routines. The sheer number of times that Charlotte Bronte uses words like liberty, freedom, passive, active, etc., etc., to express how Jane is constantly feeling this inner turmoil between her desires and the limitations of her physical environment, it would take too long to count how many times that happens. There is also a lot of imagery of animals being res- either restrained or caged to further emphasize this point. One of the most iconic quotes in this book, and I think in the English language when it comes to the English literary canon, especially British slash English, um, the British slash English literary canon is, drum roll please, I am no bird and no net ensnares me. I am a free human being with an independent will. It was yet an active thing and I was weary of an, exist- of an existence all passive. It is vain to say human beings ought to be satisfied with tranquility. They must have action and they will make it if they cannot find it. Women are supposed to be very calm generally, but women feel just as men feel. They need exercise for their faculties in a field for their efforts as much as their brothers. It is thoughtless to condemn them or laugh at them if they seek to do more or learn more than custom has pronounced necessary of their sex. So that lays the groundwork, the framework, if you will, for me to go into slight spoiler territory here, but I do feel like I have to do it in order to prove my point that I want to make about Rochester and Jane and the infamous Bertha. (laughs) So if you have never read Jane Eyre and you've come across my review, thank you for watching. I am not giving away so much as to ruin it. This is a slight spoiler, but I am not giving any specific details other than the fact that there is this character named Bertha. Now, in Jane Eyre, we tend to focus, people tend to focus on Bertha in a particular way. So who is Bertha? Bertha, and this is all I'm going to say about Bertha, is a mad woman in Mr. Rochester's attic. That's all I'm going to say. Now, people tend to look at Bertha from this very feminist perspective, which, okay, I'll allow it. <laughs> but I think that it's quite narrow. That Bertha represents how what happens when women are at the whims of men, they are, you know, demonized. Bertha's, you know, you know, people tend to look at her as representing sexuality and tension and all this other stuff. And when she doesn't fit into the confines of this Victorian society, she gets locked away. Mr. Rochester mistreats her by locking her away whatever and they see that in Jane and Bertha are often seen as parallels however and because Bertha is a mad woman and she doesn't fit into these Victorian standards she must be restrained and confined her madness prevents her from acting as a functioning member of society she's intense and she's passionate therefore she is not acceptable As readers, typically, people tend to look at Bertha, and I'm not saying that this is wrong, but I do think that it's just, it's it's just, you're you're just, it's just the tip of the iceberg. We're just scratching the surface. We, she's, we tend to view this very vague and cryptic character as a symbol for how mean Mr. Rochester is for locking her away how cruelly men treat women, it almost becomes kind of boring. I actually find that to be very boring. I hear it time and time again. And I'm like, can do, are there any new thoughts about this? Like, can we talk about something else? Because I think of it quite differently. Um, and one could argue, and I don't see many people doing this, that in Victorian society, I'm not saying I agree with Rochester, but in Victorian society, he actually did the kindest thing for Bertha. He knew that Victorian asylums were no place that anybody deserved to be, regardless of if it was Bertha, okay? 
Um, he was like, he felt that for the time and place in which he, he was in, he did her the kind of service that he could with the resources available for somebody who is considered to be mad, mentally unstable, to put her in his own home locked away than to put her into an asylum because he knew that Victorian asylums or asylums were horrid places to be. So he did the kindest thing that he could for her for that time. You don't have to agree with him, but he did do the kindest thing. Google Victorian asylums. Yeah. (laughs) Also, like I said earlier, Rochester repents for many of his choices and people don't tend to acknowledge that, that he had a, 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 a come around. Um, also, Jane does not condone a lot of his behaviors and neither does Charlotte as the ultimate storyteller. That being said, this is how I choose to, to view Bertha. I actually choose to to... I think, or I think it's more appropriate actually to look at Bertha more as a symbol rather than a character because Bertha doesn't just represent Jane and Jane's passionate side. She also represents Rochester. I know shock horror is that sacrilege to say for people who just want to demonize Rochester all the time. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. And St. John. I'm going to say St. John because I'm an American and I can't do it the English way, pronounce it the British way. St. John is a character that Jane comes across later on in this story. I'm not going to be away any more other than that. If you haven't read it, you can discover him for yourself. He is another trip with no luggage. Um, all three of these characters have something in common with Bertha. They are passionate, they are intense, and at their core, they are always constantly struggling with harnessing in that side of their natures. They are trying to still be true to themselves while wrestling with just how passionate they are. All of these characters, Jane Rochester and St. John, are very intense in slightly different ways. They all feel locked up in caged, just as Bertha is locked away in an attic. Bertha is symbolizing all of these characters trying to keep that element of them to a level that is functioning, (laughs) okay? Charlotte, again, uses a lot of caged imagery of animals pacing around to not just portray this for Jane. You know, we have the bird, the caged bird imagery with Jane. We get it with Rochester. And I've never seen anybody address this. And if they have, I just haven't come across it. I'm not saying it's not out there, but I haven't personally come across this. She also uses a lot of words like fiery, rave, mad, madness, insane, insanity to represent how all of these three characters have this predisposition to fall into birth the state of madness because they just have these very passionate personalities. Bertha represents What could happen to all of these characters should they ever become physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally limited? They will descend into madness. They have to have an outlet. They have to figure out how to properly temper their own passion in a way that, again, still allows them to be functioning members of society while still being true to themselves. And being these characters that are in a way almost to cut above the rest. It's almost like that little bit of insanity that keeps them functioning. You know what I you know what I mean? So Jane, it is because I am insane, quite insane, with my veins running fire and my heart beating faster than I can count its throbs. Forced to keep the fire of my nature continually low, to compel it to burn inwardly and never utter a cry. Though the imprisoned flame consumes vital after vital, it would be endurable. And those are quotes that are directly, there. I had so many, I had to narrow it down to two. Those are quotes, Jane is talking about herself and what she's feeling. That's Bertha, okay? And there is a situation where there's a circumstance that Jane is presented with at the, towards the end of the book 
if she chose that option, she was very well aware that she would have turned into a mad woman because that option would have spiritually killed her. And she would have turned into a caged mad woman. She's because Jane believes as long as you have your thoughts and your thoughts are your own, you're free. But if you have a person and there's a character who even tries to control her thoughts, it would drive her to madness and that would just break her. That was her cutting point. Then we have Rochester. And these are some quotes I pulled of Jane actually observing Rochester. He broke off acquaintance with all gentry and shut himself up like a hermit in a hall. So he is, there's two hermits now in the hall. We have Bertha and we have Rochester because Rochester, there's a parallel there also between Bertha and Rochester because Bert, Rochester is also a, quite a free spirit in a lot of ways. Reminded me of some wronged and fettered wild beast or bird dangerous to approach in his sullen woe, the caged eagle, those gold ringed eyes, cruelty was has extinguished. Though look as looked that sightless Samson. That quote is so rich. So again, we got this imagery earlier of Jane referring to herself as a caged. So she, she um, I am no bird and no net ensnares me. We have her observing Rochester and seeing how he's just like this caged, this time it's an eagle that represents him. And, and the eagle is the appropriate bird to represent Rochester. Um, but also we have this point here about Samson. So if you're not familiar with who Samson is, there is a Bible story of Samson and Delilah. And uh, Samson gives into the temptation of Delilah and she, cut his, she cuts his hair off and his hair is his strength. Culturally, also, if you were to do the cultural significance of hair, of Samson hair and, and the tribe that he's from, he's um, within the biblical context, hair represented strength. So she cut his hair. It is not a coincidence, of course, that Charlotte Bronte did this, showing how G Rochester, through a woman, was humbled, like Samson was humbled by Delilah. <laughs> this book is deep. Another quote about Rochester. Your, it's again, it's about his hair. This is not a coincidence. Your hair reminds me of eagle's feathers. Whether your nails are grown like bird's claws or not, I have not yet noticed. That's Jane talking to Rochester. Let's go on to St. John. St. John looks quiet, Jane, but he hides a fever in his vitals. You would think him gentle, yet in some things he, has, he is as inexorable as death. I, his ordained minister, almost rave in my restlessness. Again, St. John is a, a clergyman. And even from the outside, you know, he leaves this very quiet life as a clergyman. He has his own ambitions, but he, he has this very quiet life as a clergyman from the outside in. But those who really know him also know he's tempering a lot of his temptations. He's tempering a lot of his passions. He's tempering a lot of his... He's choosing certain things over others. Now, there's a lot of imagery with St. John that is quite icy. Ice, he's, he's cold, he's icy, he's hard, whereas Jane and Rochester are fiery. He's, you know, if you were to talk on the elemental level, he's, he's the antithesis of Rochester birth. Actually, Rochester, Bertha, and Jane on an elemental level, they're used fire. A lot of fire is used to represent them where he, a lot of ice imagery is used to represent St. John, but he is still has this disposition that is quite passionate. And so again, he is tied up into this imagery in this parallel of Bertha. You have these characters who are just, they look crazy. All right. I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going for 30 minutes. There is still so much to talk about with Jane Eyre, and I just think it's impossible to get it all in a review. I think as I continue to read Jane Eyre, and I continue to annotate it and pick up on other things, um, 
I will probably have to keep revisiting this book in post to come, probably written post on Instagram. I tend to read this book every three to four years. And so the more I read it, the more I pick up on it. And the more that I, the more that's it's solidified that this is my favorite book. It wasn't until my fourth reread that I actually noticed this connection between not just Jane and Bertha, but Bertha and Rochester, Bertha and St. John. Also, there are other characters that due to choices that they make go into madness, a form of madness. Jane has a cousin. His outcome is not nice. Mrs. Reed's outcome is not nice. And you could really have a broader conversation about what happens when you temper certain things and you, or, and you don't temper others. It drives you to this form of insanity. I really think that Jane Eyre is a special novel. It is gorgeously written. Charlotte Bronte was a, a ahead of her time. It is so profound and intelligent. And despite, again, despite this being published in 1847, Jane to me is a character that always feels modern. It shows that Charlotte Bronte has a skill for getting at the heart of what it is to be and intrinsic, intrinsically what it's like to be a human being and what it is that human beings strive for and really truly desire and the things that they have to struggle with. And for me, that's what makes this a timeless read. Each read only gets better. I will be reading this book for the rest of my life. There's still so much to discuss. Like I said, I, it just gets better with age. It, it held its own as number one. I do think I have another, a new number two though, which I don't know why. I never realized that before. We'll talk about it. I reviewed that book later in the, uh, coming up. But as you could guess, this was a five out of five for me. So there it is. It's not a top read of the year because I only reserve my top reads of the year for books that are new to me. Um, I don't count rereads for that. So have you read Jane Eyre? Is it on your TBR? Is there anything in my review, because this is a book that's widely discussed, is there anything in my review, especially for those who've read the book, that seemed new to you? Or am I tripping? Like, am I tripping with the thing between Bertha and Rochester and Bertha and St. John? I personally don't think I am. But, you know, is there anything that you're like, oh, okay, 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 that's interesting. So, um, yeah, please feel free to comment below on Jane Eyre. And if you would also like to, please feel free to like this video and subscribe to my channel. If you would like to um, follow me on Instagram where all of my book content actually goes live first, please feel free to follow me there. I'm going to sign off. I have been sitting in this chair talking for two hours. Happy New Year and I will see you in the next one.